Today we're tackling one of the first point-and-click adventure games, Deja Vu, A Nightmare Comes True, released for the Apple Macintosh by Icom Simulations in 1985. It aimed to do for adventure games what adventure did for text-based interactive fiction using the Mac OS's natural architecture to tell a story. Despite the name, it's not a horror game. This is a film noir, hard-boiled detective thriller, as shown on a game's box. There's a shot of whiskey, a fedora, some cards, and a package of Lucky Strike cigarettes. Right away, it gets you into the game's overall theme, while not revealing anything about the plot. The manual reinforces this, using a sort of tough-guy 40s voice when telling you how to use your disk drive and how to navigate the interface. It, too, however, avoids any concrete information about the story, the player, or the setting. Still, it does a good job of setting expectation and mood. The game was a big hit, and in just a year or two was ported to the Apple II GS, Atari ST, Commodore 64, and Amiga, along with a truly vile-looking CGA DOS port, and these all try to mimic the Mac OS's environment as best they can. The C64 port in particular suffers from lack of a mouse. Most people are probably more familiar with the 1990 Nintendo Entertainment System port, though being of a far lower resolution, lacking a mouse or keyboard input in dealing with Nintendo of America's content guidelines, meant that a lot of the game had to be reworked. While it follows the story of the original, the feel of playing it is far different. You can buy an emulated version of Deja Vu on Steam that offers both the Apple II GS and the original Mac versions, but I found them difficult to read, so I'll be playing the Windows 3.1 port which has improved visuals, but, like the Mac release, makes use of the operating system's architecture. Here we can see the main window, and it is very much a Windows 3.x window. We have our, our menu bar up here, File, uh, which lets us uh, save, load, exit. Our special menu, which lets us uh, clean up our windows, enlarge them, change the font, change the sound, set up the sound. We're not going to mess with any of that too much. Uh, Window, which lets us arrange our icons, uh, and Help, which has, you know, uh, About and everything else, uh, as you can see there, giving us uh, some credits. We also have our main graphical window in the center here, the name of the current room we're in. We have our inventory window. Uh, we have our commands, we have a button to indicate the self if we want to apply any of these commands to the self. Uh, we have a window for our exits, and we have the main text window down at the bottom. And it's through these that we will experience the game. Most of them can be moved around, and they, they do behave like normal windows in the, the system, in the operating system. Uh, it's less so in the other computer ports because, again, they don't have that native... GUI interface that the Windows and Mac versions do, but uh, we, we can make use of it anyway. Um, as you can tell, the art is very much enhanced over the other versions, and I kind of wish that we could drag the window down a little bit, but it's just this size and just in the middle. So let's go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. Welcome to A Nightmare Come True. You are waking from a stupor that feels like a chronic hangover after a week in Vegas. There's a throbbing bump on the back of your head, big enough to make your hat size look like an Olympic record. You notice your right palm is covered with dried blood, but you neither see nor feel any open wounds on your body. On your left forearm, you feel a sharp pain under the shirt sleeve. Rolling up the sleeve, you discover what looks like a fresh needle mark. Have I been injected with something, you wonder? Then you realize, I? Who am I? You can't remember. As you come out of the fog, you are able to make out your surroundings. You have no idea where you are or why you're here. You have no memory whatsoever. All right, so the primary way, one of the ways we can interact with things is uh, we can click on an object uh, and then click examine. Taking a careful look at your surroundings, you realize you're lucky to be alive. The bugs in this place look like they are about to have you for lunch. You can click on specific objects as well. Uh, it's a full roll of toilet paper. It adds a civilized touch to these barbaric surroundings. Not everything you can see is an object. We can't really interact with the walls at all. Uh, we can interact with this jacket, though. So if we examine it, it's a gray trench coat that matches your trousers and probably your taste. The, now, we could open it. We could close it. We could speak to it. We could operate it. Um, we could go to it. We could hit it. We could try to consume it. But we don't need to do any of those things. Instead, what we can do 
So we can grab it and we can drag it over to our inventory and drop it in. And that's how you take stuff in the game. It's also how you can drop things as well. Uh, doing so has revealed the gun. It doesn't tell us it did that down here. It just does it in the description itself. So we can go ahead and grab the gun as well. And when we do, uh, we can see that it changes to the picture of a pistol. And this can scroll, you know, the window could be resized. Uh, it is, it, it behaves like a normal window. One thing we can do is if we go to uh, special and then clean up, it'll automatically reorganize our inventory, which is pretty cool, uh, honestly. And there's no real limit to how many things we can carry. It's not, it doesn't have that kind of inventory puzzles, uh, but instead, you know, we can scroll and everything else. Uh, a shortcut to doing things, to open this door, for example, we could click on the door and hit open, or we could just double click and it opens. Same thing, if there's a direction you want to go, you can just double click on the way out, and here we are. You're in the washroom. From the looks of it, you figure the janitors must be on strike. Uh, so let's go ahead, take a look in the mirror. You, you see yourself reflected in the mirror. The face stares back at you as though it belonged to a stranger. You again realize with horror that you can't remember who you are. That's inconvenient. Click to continue. And we could play around with the sink if we wanted to, but there's no really reason to. Uh, so let's go ahead and open the door and leave. You're in a hallway. There's a women's room, there's some water on the floor, there's a bar, there's a crack in the wall. Uh, but before we do that, I forgot to mention this. Um, if we take our jacket and open it, we get a sub-window with the trench coat's personal inventory. And we have a bunch of quarters, we have a lighter, uh, what looks like a handkerchief with the monogrammed JS, we have a wallet, we have some shades, and we have some smokes. So we're going to go ahead and take some of this out of the... Uh, out of the jacket. Uh, we can hold down shift and click these uh, coins to select them and move them as a unit so we can take our quarters out uh, because we will not we don't want to have to fuss around with the jacket every time we need a quarter. Uh, we can also open this secondary container of the wallet. It's a wallet made of black leather. It has the initials JS embossed on the corner so maybe that's our uh, our initials. We have that on the, the handkerchief and as, as well. But let's go ahead and open our wallet. We have uh, some money. I think it's a $20 bill. We have a key. We'll take that. And we have whatever this is. Let's examine that. It's a card with several tiny holes punched into it. Printed on the words are Private Access Card, Penthouse Suite, Seagull, Apartment 1A. So we'll take that too just so we don't have to go through all the problem of digging around through our inventory. And I'll explain more about why we don't want to do that later. But these windows, now that we're done with them, we can just go and do the context menu and click close. There's no right clicking <laughs> to, to do that here, unfortunately. We have to go to the little symbol here if you don't remember how Windows 3.1 works. Let's uh, move on to the bar. And we can use these uh, to travel too, in case any of the exits are off the screen, like the bathroom we just came out of, the men's room is down here, uh, but we can't see it. So we would have to use the icon here in the exits panel. But we're going this way. You're in a dank, empty bar. It is nighttime outside and obviously after hours, either that or you've scared everyone away. Uh, we can see the in the reverse of the window here, we're in Joe's bar. There's a drink on the counter. There's a couple doors. Uh, the front door is locked. And unfortunately, there's it only unlocks with a key, and that's not the one we have. So we're just going to ignore that for now. Uh, we can open this door here, which will uh, lead to a back room. But for now, let's go up the stairs. You're upstairs in the hall leading to a door. On the walls are some posters of fighters. We can click on the posters. 
It's a poster of Puff McMuffin. No boxer ever took a dive so gracefully as he. It's a poster of Doghouse Riley, a boxer who never did get very tall, but always tried to be. And we get another flashback. It looks like a poster of you, but then you can't remember who you are. The name underneath says Ace. It doesn't ring a bell. So if we're Ace, then all the monogrammed stuff we have is JS, which unless we have another name besides Ace that is JS, we have someone else's stuff, which is very possible. But the question is still, who are we and what did what has been done to us? Why have we lost our memory? Who shot us up with drugs? This is the fundamental mystery we're trying to solve, and we're wandering around this empty bar trying to figure it out. Door is now open. You're in what looks like a reception room or a secretary's office. You detect the odor of cheap perfume still lingering in the air. You feel very dazed. You had better do something about it. Your memory loss is making you weary. You feel like you've been up for many days without any sleep, only worse. And that is our first hint that we have a ticking clock. Whatever we've been injected with that removed our memory is also slowly causing us to lose our cognitive sense. And the more actions we take, uh, which is, includes examining things or moving things in and out of our inventory, the quicker we are going to effectively lose the game. So this is another one of those time limits that makes it imperative to not waste too much time that we don't have, at least at this point. In the game so let's um unfortunately we're not going to be able to examine everything but we will go ahead and, and uh, try to do things in an efficient manner let's go ahead and check the desk out and the desk we see an envelope let's open the envelope and in the envelope is uh, what is that It's a bill from Do from Dr. Brody's pharmacy. The bill is made out to Joe's Bar. The items on the bill are as follow. One syringe, 50 cc's of diethanol trimming, 50 cc's of bisodiamuteus, and 50 cc's of sodium pentahol. Well, that one I recognize. That's truth serum. Uh, there's also an address for doctor, on the bill for Dr. Brody's Pharmacy, 934 West Sherman, Chicago, Illinois, which gives us a sense of setting. We are in Chicago, and it gives us an address. Now, in the Nintendo version, when you want to travel to these addresses, you can just choose them from a, a tab. But here, we're going to have to enter them manually, type them in. So I'm going to go ahead and write that down, 934 West Sherman. Because, again, it'll take extra turns to look at the uh, receipt again, which we'll take and drop into our inventory. Now let's go ahead and clean up our inventory while we're at it. Oh, wrong window. Now we go, and we can see that it automatically does that, and that's kind of neat. I just think it's cool, uh, especially in a game from this era. We'll close our envelope. Close the desk. And that door is locked. Well, let's try our key. So the way to use items is that you click on the item, click on operate, and then click on what you want to use it with. The door is now unlocked. So there we go. Open the door, go through, and it's a corpse. You're in an office. There's a dead body slumped over the desk. His left hand, left, his left hand still grips the phone receiver. In the background, there is a wall safe, a window, and a telephone. So let's go ahead and... Uh, well, the first things first, let's search the dead body, which is done with uh, open. Well, let's examine him first. It's a man who appears to be lacking something, namely life. There are three bullet holes in him. He suggests a memory. The face rings a sour bell. You feel as though you should be able to recall who it is, but your memory fails you. All right, let's go ahead and search him with open to open his inventory. He has what looks like a Mercedes car key. So let's go ahead and grab that. And let's go ahead and try and open the desk to see if there's a drawer. There is. We have a pencil, which we can take. Another key. We have a lot of keys now. In fact, I'm going to, since we use this one to open this door, I'm going to dump that in the, in the desk just so we're uncluttered. And a piece of paper. It's blank. Uh, so we can just 
close that window, close the desk. Uh, we don't have anybody to call on the phone. Uh, looks like you ripped the receiver off anyway, so it might not be any use to us. And we don't know the combination to that safe, so we're just going to get out of here. We can open the door, and this gives us a, a new exit. So we'll head out there. You're on a fire escape. You know how it works, don't you? When there's a fire, you use it to escape. All right, uh, we are going to climb up the fire escape. We don't see any way to do that in the picture, but we can see here where the exits are. We can go down, we can go up, we can go back through the window. Let's go up. You're standing on the third floor fire escape. You have a breathtaking view of the alley below. All right, let's go ahead and open that window and climb through. You were in a weird room. Yeah, it is pretty weird. Uh, there's a chair with straps. There's some little vials. There's a bucket. Let's take a look in the uh, the waste basket here. We found a syringe. We'll need that later, so let's go ahead and and take that. Close the bucket. And these vials. Metarazine. Dathomol triminine, and that's empty. That's one of the drugs we saw on the uh, on the bill of sale. I don't think we need anything there, so we're gonna do nothing. Instead, we're going to hit the elevator button and then go through into the uh, into the elevator. We've got a few unlabeled buttons. Presumably, this the third level is uh, the top is the floor we're on. Right below that is uh, the floor of the office. Below that, we don't know. And below that, we don't know. So let's hit the bottom button. Whoosh, the floor believes you, beneath you gives way and you fall through a dark shaft. Falling, falling till splash. You're in the sewer. Be careful where you step. Okay. Great Scott, your way is blocked by a ferocious sewer alligator. It is heading straight for you. It looks hungry. Think fast. All right, we will operate our gun on the sewer gator. You just saved your own life. The alligator would have had you for brunch if you didn't shoot it. Nobody heard the gunshot as you were deep in the sewers. All right, well, that was lucky. And that's uh, one of the NPCs in the game. They show up as essentially random events when you're traversing locations. Some of them are dangerous. Some of them are helpful. You're in the sewer, don't get excited. It was meant literally, not figuratively. All right, we can go ahead, behind, we can go up. Uh, let's go ahead and go up. You're in a weird chamber. There's a round hobbity door and a regular looking door. I'm gonna open them both just so that we can easily traverse if we need to. And let's go through the weird hobbity door. You're in a casino. There is nobody around. Do you think your sudden presence may have something to do with it? Uh, possibly. Most of this is decorative. Uh, the roulette tables don't do anything. We have a couple portraits on the walls. We have a couple slot machines. Uh, what we can do is we can gamble with the slot machines to get more quarters. We'll need more than the uh, seven we have, and they're, they're kind of difficult to come by. So gambling here is probably the best way to go about it. And to do that, first we're going to save. And it uses the typical window, Windows uh, save architecture. Uh, because if we waste all of our quarters, well, then we're, we're basically screwed. Um, but this is practically a necessity to make the game completable, solvable, within, the, within our time limit. So... Operate the quarter on the machine. Uh, I think it's this one that works. I don't remember. Oh, there's no noise, and the wheels don't look like they moved in months. I think that this machine is broken. All right, well, I chose the wrong one. The slot machine clings away. The wheels spin. The excitement builds. You come up a loser. Maybe gambling doesn't pay. It's possible that whatever one you try first is the one that's broken, uh, because I've tried both, and it hasn't been consistent. Once a loser, always a loser. Maybe you should stop before you get addicted. Maybe you should stop before you get addicted. 
And there we go. We got the jackpot. That looks like uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven times four, 28, 29, 30. 30 quarters. So that'll that'll do us for the whole game. And thankfully, we can collect them all at once instead of doing it one at a time. So there we go. We have a ton of quarters, enough to get us through the game, and we don't need to worry about money. So there we go. The slot machine is now closed because, well, we, well, closed the window. Go back through the sewer, through the other door. And this brings us to the wine cellar. It looks like it could use a good sweeping. Would you care to volunteer? No, thank you. We're just going to keep going, and we are back in the bar. If we hadn't opened this door earlier, we would have had to go back up through the elevator and everything else, and that's just kind of a pain. So, uh, yeah, we are, we are using a little bit of foreknowledge, but we kind of have to if we're going to make it through the game, because we simply don't have enough turns to discover all of this through trial and error. All right, so we have this key that we found. So let's see if that works for the front door. It does, so we can go and get out. You're in the street. We can go ahead and drop that key now. We'll use the car key to open up the car. Front door is now unlocked. Front door is now open. Let's save just in case and get in the car. We see nothing unusual about the plush interior of the Mercedes-Benz. Let's check the glove compartment. There may be objects in the glove compartment, but probably no gloves. Your memory is almost totally shot. You feel heavily sedated. Whatever caused your memory loss is making you feel progressively worse. You feel if you don't do something soon, there isn't much time left. Well, that's just cheery. All right. Inside the glove compartment, we find a few things. First of all, there is a car registration made to Joey Seagal of 1212 West Street. Let's go ahead and make a note of that. 1212 West and street it's a street map with a special route outlined in ink on the back of the map there is writing it reads ace follow the route exactly that way you'll know if you're being followed don't break any speed limits you don't want the cops to stumble into the trunk and find mrs sternwood well if that isn't uh ominous i don't know what is but we'll take that map too it's a snapshot of a woman. You feel as though you should recognize this broad, and broad she is, about 400 pounds worth. They must have moved the cameras back about the length of a football field just to fit her into the frame, but your memory fails to tell you who she is. That's an unpleasant joke, but let's go ahead and take the picture with us. I'll click to continue, and I'll take the photo. Close that. Uh, we don't need to get into the hood. We need to get into the trunk. Let's see if we can start the car. Operate. Key. We just fell for the oldest trick in the book. At least the oldest since they've been making car bombs. You've been blown into little bite-sized bits. Start again. You have died. Click to continue. All right, let's go ahead and load our save. Out of the car, we have our everything. Uh, opening the hood will we'll do much the same thing, blow up the, the car bomb. So there's nothing we can do there. You're standing in front of the police station. The warmth of its exterior proves to be inviting, at least for those with a good bump on the head. Let's keep going right. Aye, splat. It seems you have just fallen into a deep construction pit. You should watch where you're going next time. So... Unfair deaths, just seemingly at random. Uh, a hallmark of the genre, really, but unfortunate for the game. So let's go ahead and uh, load again. Well, we don't really need to go that way, and we don't want to go into the precinct yet because, well, they'll arrest us for murdering that guy. So we'll go back left. Keep going left. You're in front of a newsstand that is open for business. Let's buy a paper. The headline on the evening edition reads, Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. So that puts us in a state of place. We are in 1941, apparently. Let's go ahead and buy a paper. The newsboy says you owe him 25 cents. 
All right. The newsboy says the cops have been roaming around the area looking for suspicious characters. They got a call from some dame who lives across the street from Joe's bar. She told them that she saw some funny goings on around here, and she gave a description that fits you. Better watch your step. Well, that's good to know. You run into a bum who blocks your way. He stands so close that you can feel the toxic levels in your system take on new, uncharted heights, something you wouldn't think was possible. The following words dribble out of his mouth. I got a scoop, something that'll save your life if it's worth 20 bucks to ya. He presses nearer, waiting for a reply. You'd better hurry before he passes out. All right, let's see what he's got. Uh, we do have 20 bucks. Here it is. Operate on the guy. The bum gladly takes your money and says, Joey's hitmen have been looking for you. I got word that he's waiting in your office. All right, well, let's be wary of that. You're standing on the street in front of Pete's all-night gun palace. We can go inside. You're inside Pete's all-night gun palace. There's a dental-looking man behind the counter just waiting to offer you his helpful service. He bellows, is there something you want, Mac? Uh, there's not really anything we need at the moment, so let's just leave. We already have a gun. We can keep going west. You're standing on Peoria Street. And there's a cab. So let's go ahead and get in the cab. In the back of the cab, the hack in front seems nervous. What do you wish to say to the cab driver? Okay, so this is basically how we get around the city. We just give him an address and he'll take us there. Uh, we know that the bar we're on is Peoria Street. We have found two other addresses so far. Uh, one for uh, Sherman Street, where the, the doctor's bill is. And the other uh, for West End, which is where Siegel's car registration indicates that he lives. So let's go ahead um, and figure out what's up with, with uh, Joey. The guy, the guy whose car it is. Joey Siegel, J.S. Uh, the guy whose monogrammed possessions we currently have. And possibly the guy that we shot. So let's go ahead and uh, head, head to... What was the address? 1212 West End. And he hits the fair thing, and we get there really quick. The cabbie accelerates. As you arrive at your destination, he looks at the meter and says, Here you are. You owe me 75 cents. And the way we pay says right here, pay here. We just drag three quarters, and we will drop them right in the slot. The pay slot eagerly accepts your money. We could do this one at a time, too, but that counts for as three turns for our time limit, and then we really don't have the uh, the time to spend doing that. Thank you. Have a nice day. If you don't pay him, if you get out without paying, he'll call the cops on you, and eventually they'll show up and end your game for you. So let's just go out here. You're outside the entrance to the expensive-looking Stanford Arms. Nothing to do but go inside. Let's take a look. It appears to be a slot for something. Well, we just so happen to have this security card that has this address on it, so we'll go ahead and do that. The elevator door swings open. We go inside. Again, there's nothing but a slot, so let's try that again. The elevator door slides shut. The elevator moves automatically. You have no choice but to go along for the ride. The elevator stops and the door slides open. All right. You're in a swanky penthouse pad. One look and you instantly feel that the owner of this place deserves to be shot, which we probably did. Uh, we see there's a magazine on the table. Physical Culture Magazine has many a fine article to enlighten the human race where the human race enjoys to be enlightened the most. It's 1940s porn. Uh, culture, Physical culture is a uh, euphemism for nudism. Uh, and here we have some kind of photo. Let's examine it. It's a photograph of a very stout-looking brunette. On the back, you find an address, 520 South Kedzie. So let's go ahead and write that down. 520 South Kedzie. A very Chicago address. So we'll go ahead and we'll take that to... And I think that's really all there is to do here. So let's leave. Uh, hopefully this will 
get us through the elevator again. Yep. Back down. And then we can leave and leave and get back in the cab. Talk to the guy again. South Kedzi. All right, we have to give him the actual address. And what was it? Uh, 520 South Kedzi. There we go. The cabbie accelerates as you arrive at your destination. He looks at the meter and says 75 cents. It's going to cost 75 cents every time we go anywhere. And out we go. And we are at South Kedzie, a dilapidated bungalow. The door won't open. It's locked. Well, we don't have a key, but we do have a universal door opener. Blam! After you shot the door, after you shut the door, it looks like it can now be opened. You're inside the bungalow. You smell a strong odor of cheap perfume. See if there's anything in the drawer. Ooh, there is. There is a key, which we'll snag. And a diary, which we will take. It's a diary. Inside, there's a long account of an affair between the author and a wealthy married man, John Sternwood. That might be another J.S. You notice certain details in the account, such as the threat of a jealous man named Joey Siegel. So we got two J.S.'s who once had a relationship with the author and the desire of the author to win John Sturdwood over so she can live a life of wealth and luxury. Let's take that. And what's this? It's a slip of paper with three numbers on it, 33, 24, 36. That sounds like a combination, so we'll take that too. And that is just an earring. We don't need it, so we can leave. All right, our other address is, uh, what was it? We'll grab three quarters, pay for the ride, and go. Oh, the door is locked, but we do have a key, so let's go ahead and uh, operate on the door. You're inside a doctor's office. There is nobody around. Perhaps you should wait for a nurse. Well, we don't have time to wait for a nurse. Instead, we will... Oh, we need a combination for this. And unfortunately, there is no combination for this in the game. It's not the one we found, so we'll have to use our universal lockpick again. We just did major damage to the file cabinet, and we have a whole bunch of files here. The first one is the Siegel file. There's a log of orders placed by Joey Siegel for the drug sodium pentahol. You can also all the orders are held by Siegel's secretary, Marcia Vickers. There's also a carbon copy of a bill made out to Joe's bar. The items on the bill are as follows, just before. So we, now we can use that to prove that Joey's the one who bought these drugs. Sodium carbonate, harmless, slightly alkaline solution. How do you spell relief? Bisodimiotis, the antidote to diethanol trimonine. And I think that's one of the things we were drugged with, so let's keep an eye out for bisodiumatis. Diethyl trimonine. It's a drug that miraculously blocks all memory. It even achieves permanent memory loss if the subject has been injected and left the effects of the drug for a period of a few hours. In order to counteract the process, the subject must be injected with the antidote within that period. An overdose can be fatal. All right, well, that's obviously what we've been drugged with. So let's go ahead and uh, see if any of these drugs are the ones we need. Chemopapane, we don't need that. Chemopapain, we don't need that. Bis, biso, that's, we do need that. Oh, almost dragged the cabinet off the screen. 
You are rapidly turning into a vegetable. You can't go on much longer. You know you must do something to reverse the effects of your memory loss, but it is almost too late. We're going to need a few of these, actually, so let's quickly see if we can find two more. Sodium bicarbonate. There's another one of those. Sodium pentahol. I'm going to take that just in case. I need to make somebody talk. Medrazine, we don't need that. Alfreal, we don't need that. Sodium pentahol, we already got one. And that's another one of those. Okay. So let's go ahead and find where we left our syringe. Oh, there it is. Fill it full of this. The contents of the vial are now in the syringe. The syringe now contains bisodiumitis. So we're going to use that on ourself. The, bisomite, the bisodiumitis takes effect. The first waves of your lost memory start rolling in. This one seems to be from your childhood. It's mother. She's baked a cake. Maybe it's your birthday, or maybe it's in the family celebration of your departure for boarding school. Let's do it again. You have one of those feelings, like you've done this before. There's a word for it, but that's the one thing you can't seem to remember. Ha! Huh. And one more time. Same effect, so I don't know if we actually needed to use it three times or not. But now we have our drugs in our system. Go up the stairs. All right. Ace Harding, Private Eye. This is our office. However, look at that shadow behind the door. The bum told us that there is a uh, hitman out to get us. And if we look at our gun... Oh, that's the diary. There's a bookmark in it. J another JS. Hmm. Opening our gun, though, all we have left are spent cartridges. So we don't have any bullets left in our gun. So right now, we are going to kind of creep away. Uh, and there is a gun shop that we saw in uh, on the other street um, where Joe's bar was. But since our memory is returning, we can start looking at some of the objects we found and see if we have any more insight. So the street map, with a special route outlined in inked on the back of the map, there's the instructions, the writing is addressed to you, but you know that you've never seen this map before. Something's very fishy about it. One thing you recognize, the route on the map leads to Joe's bar. Now you can remember the address of the bar, 1060 South Peoria. So let's go ahead, click to continue, and get in the cab. Talk to the cabbie. 1060 South Peoria. And there we go. Another memory wave from your childhood comes through. It's Taco, your pet dog. Say woof, Taco. That a boy. Taco wants to play. Taco sent you to the hospital for stitches. You're standing on the street in front of Pete's all-night gun palace. You see a mugger in your way. He wants all of your money. It might be wise to give it to him. Oh, I'll give it to him. Sako, a quick jab to the mugger's eye stuns him. He runs down the street in a panic. You're lucky to catch him, catch him off guard. All right, into the gun shop. It's a 38 bullet. I think we only need one, so I'm going to buy a bullet. You now owe me 25 cents. 
You now owe me nothing. There we go. We got our bullet. So we can uh, take care of that mugger. Unfortunately, we did have to waste three quarters on the trip, but whatever. I think we have enough. Oh, don't want to pay him yet until we're gone to where we need to go. Let's see, where was it? All right, we're going to pay him. Get out of the car, go into the office building, go up the stairs. And there's the hitman. Well, let's go ahead and open our gun. The gun is now open. Another memory wave from your childhood comes through. It's Susie Q, the girl next door. Susie Q gave you your first kiss. In fact, she gave all the boys in the neighborhood their first kiss. Susie Q grew up to be very popular. Right, we're going to reload the gun. I'll click to continue, that's why. I've got to take some of the spent cartridges out. Blam! You've shot whatever was standing inside the office. It won't open its lock. Well, it's the same key, oddly enough. It's now open. You're in a shabby office that is practically barren. The shelves are just empty. Either the previous occupant of the place went out of business, or he just has very little business to show anything for. Oh, well, that's kind of sad. Let's see, we have a few files in the cabinet. It's a file that reads, Grudge between Joey Siegel and Sugar Shack. Be on the lookout for anything suspicious between these two. Sugar Shack is known to have a burning hatred for something that Siegel did to her. Sugar Shack, in the past, be prepared for fireworks. We haven't met Sugar Shack yet. It's a file that reads, Case of the Blackmailed Alderman. Solved when Sugar Shack was discovered to be the blackmailer. I destroyed her evidence and got the alderman off the hook. Sugar Shack is doing five years in the pen. Well, it sounds like she doesn't like me much either. It appears to be a letter that reads, Ace, I've got a deal for you, a way that you can get you off the hook with your gambling debts. It's a simple kidnap job. All you've got to do is pick up this wealthy woman and deliver her to me. I'll worry about the rest. If all goes well, I'll collect a night fat ransom while you get to live. You even get to consider your gambling debts as being paid. I trust you to pull it off right, because if you bungle it, you'll take the rap. I've got everything planned so that nothing will lead to me. This is the only offer you'll ever get, so think it over and call you-know-who. If you refuse, then it's been nice knowing you. All right, well, that seems like the general plot. I was uh, the fall guy for this uh, ransoming attempt. Let's go ahead and clean up our... No, not that one. Our inventory window. Looking a little raggedy. There's something very soothing about watching it organize itself. Although not terribly well. That's good enough. Right, in the desk we find more ammo. That's fine to me. Go ahead to go to our gun, open that, get rid of the spent cartridge, reload. And there we go. Close our desk and everything else. All right, we can leave.
should go back to Peoria Street because there's two things left to check out. If I can remember the address. 1060 Peoria. Oh, got to click on the text box, of course. 1060 Peoria Street. All right. Yeah, there's the trunk of the car and there's the uh, the safe in the office. We should be able to get into... Oh, the mugger blocks your way. His black eye shines as a souvenir of your last encounter. He says, okay, hotshot, I wouldn't try it again if I were you. You know what this is, don't you? It's a gun. Give me your money now. And we'll pop him in the face again. Sako, a quick, a swift left hook to the mugger's left eye sends him reeling back in pain. He darts away, even more stunned than before. You're taking an awful chance with this guy. He may be back with a vengeance. I'm not worried. All right, first of all, let's go up the stairs to the office with the dead guy. And what was our combination again? Oh, it's on this. 33, 24, 36. Wall safe is now open. And we get uh, a key, yet another key. Put that there. It's a bundle of checks that have been stamped insufficient funds. The checks are made out to Joe's bar and signed by Ace Harding. The total value of the checks exceeds $1,000. Wow, so I've been passing bad checks. Okay, take those two. Go back down. Save the game. The key fits. You turn the key opening the trunk inside the trunk you've had help notice a very large object taking up a lot of space. More fat jokes. I think you've seen plenty already. All right, well, let's go ahead and uh, talk to her. Hi. The woman can't hear you. She must be unconscious. Let's take the gag off. And we'll go ahead and uh, use the sodium pentahol on her. The woman is talking from the unconscious. She says, take me home, please take me home. 626 Auburn Road. Take me there, take me home. She stops talking, falling back into complete unconsciousness. All right. The mugger blocks your way again, this time sporting two nasty shiners. He says in the quavering voice, I was hoping I'd bump into you again. You think you're pretty tough. Well, this is a gun. You don't argue with a gun. Give me your money. And I will pop him right in the face. Socko, a lightning fast sock in the nose, puts stars in his eyes. He stumbles for a moment and runs away again. It looks like you're dealing with a bluff artist, but I wouldn't take too many chances. And in fact, if we run into him again, we're going to have to start giving him money or he'll shoot us. We can only get away with popping him in the face three times, unfortunately. But that's all we need there. So let's go left, 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 get in the cab. And we will go to, what was it? 26 Auburn Road. And we'll go ahead and give him his quarters and leave. All right, here we are in front of an enormous house. Let's check the mailbox first. 
It's a letter. And inside is a ransom note. The lettering is made of newspaper cutouts. It reads, Mr. Sternwood, your wife is in our possession. You have 24 hours to collect $20,000 in $100 bills. If you contact the police, she's dead. Be standing on the corner of Peoria and Elm at exactly 12 midnight tomorrow. Be sure to have the ransom in an inconspicuous briefcase. There you'll be contacted with further instructions. Let's go ahead and take that as evidence and close the mailbox, which also closes the envelope. The front door is a huge knocker. You're in the mansion vestibule. The butler explains he has strict orders not to let anyone in the house unannounced, especially while the master is asleep. Good day. All right, let's try that again. You're in the mansion vestibule. You've obliterated the butler with a tremendous punch. He now lies in an unconscious heap just inside the doorway. He probably won't try to interfere with you now. All right, well, let's, uh, let's go up the stairs. You're in a hallway. All right, let's pick a door, go through. You're in a bedroom. There's a woman asleep in the bed. You smell a cheap, strong perfume odor in the air. There is a glasses, a pen, and a notepad. It's a blank notepad. You notice that the top sheet of the pad has several indentations that appear to be the result of someone having written on the sheet that was formerly above it. Because the indentations are light, you are unable to read what was written. Well, good thing we saved that pencil. Because we can use the old canard of rubbing it on the notepad. Using the pencil to shade over the indentations on the pad, you are now able to read the indentations. The notepad reads as follows. There's a lot here, and it's basically the whole plot. Uh... The whole thing where they they uh, they ambush you, they knock you out, they inject you. The whole the whole plot is basically spelled out here. Um, so we're good as far as that goes. And in the next room, in the bedroom, it's the master bedroom. There's a man asleep in the bed. And we find a few things here. Let's go ahead and open the envelope. It's a letter that reads, Mr. Sternwood, this is my final warning. Either you lay off, hands off Vickers once and for all, or your wife gets the story. I don't think your wife will look upon you so favorably in her will after that. I'll give you one other option, since Vickers belongs to me, and you can pay for her if you want her that badly. She'll cost you 20 grand. I want an answer today. So that's even more complex, uh, convoluted backstabbing and such so we now have basically all the evidence of the plot uh to to clear our own names so let's go ahead uh head outside get in the car and for one last time uh go back to peoria street And Margaret blocks your way once again. He obviously has a broken nose. He seems rather unstable this sign, saying, That's it, you curse word. Now I'm really mad. If you don't cough up the money now, I'm going to plug you full of holes. All right, so we are going to have to give him some money. Not all of our money, necessarily. Not that we have much more use for it, but we can give him a quarter. The man takes your money and skips away, saying, Ha ha, the gun wasn't even loaded. And yet, if we had refused to give him a quarter, he would have shot us. So there you go. Uh, we still have a lot of evidence on us that doesn't exactly exonerate us. Uh, in fact, it implicates us quite a bit. So let's go ahead and get rid of that first by going down into the sewer.
Here we go. So now we can take anything we have on us that is uh, evidence against us and drop it into the sewer. It's not good enough to just drop it anywhere else in the game world because presumably the cops will eventually find it. But here we, at this point, we can throw it into the sewer and it'll be gone forever. So let's go ahead one last time and uh, clean up our window. and figure out which evidence doesn't exonerate us exactly, but implicates us. Um, starting with the gun that we used to kill Joey, it's got our fingerprints on it. And we did kill the hitman too, so let's just jump that in the sewer. Uh, these bad checks, we can probably get rid of them, their motive. Oh, the map, that's a big one. Let's go ahead and dump that. And the one where I'm asked to do the task, we'll get rid of that too. I think that's everything, but we'll save it just in case. We're forgetting something. And we'll get out. All right, now we'll go to the police and this should be it. Fingers crossed, if we haven't forgotten anything, we'll save it again, just in case. And we'll go in. The door is now open. Gotcha. You're in the hands of the police. They're very glad to see you. The evidence you brought to them proves to be interesting, especially in the courtroom where you eventually wind up. In the course of a highly publicized trial concerning the kidnapping of Mrs. Sternwood and the murder of Joey Siegel, three bits of evidence come to light. The diary found in the vicar's bungalow and the blackmail letter and time tale that you found in Sternwood's bedroom. These three items put together paint the picture of a conspiracy by Sternwood and Vickers to eliminate Mrs. Sternwood and Joey Siegel and to make you take the fall for it. The diary with the blackmail letter proves strong evidence of a motive for such actions. The timetable indicates how they may have done it. Sternwood and Vickers are grilled for hours on the witness stand. Under the weight of their evidence and from the skilled pressure tactics of your lawyer, Vickers breaks down and admits to their crime. Congratulations, Ace. And we get to enter our name. And we could print this up if we wanted, you know, proof of our, our school of investigation graduation. And that's it. Deja vu, a nightmare comes true. Right away, we can see a few innovative approaches in the graphical adventure format, namely the windowed environment and the point-and-click interface. It's rough, sure, and far from what the genre will eventually become, but there's a strong sense of, of immediacy in being able to click and drag objects that improves on a purely textual parser. It's also intensely personal from a first-person perspective and dealing with questions of identity and memory. Sure, Yes, you wake up and you don't know who you are as a clumsy device, but in Deja Vu it works, both in setting up the core mystery of who you are and who did this to you, and form the film noir genre. The flashback sequences after you've dosed yourself are a nice touch too. You don't get everything back right away, but instead you get a few visions, and then additional context when you examine the objects in your inventory. That's part of a broader trend in the game, where your written descriptions of everything are dripping with characterization, telling you who you are which is unfortunate as the ticking clock of the slow overdose means that you don't really have the leisure to linger and appreciate all the details in the environments. Likewise, while you have to put together the pieces of what's happened from found documents, every inventory manipulation and command advances the clock, making it feel like you don't have time to read everything you discover. The game penalizes you for indulging in what it has to offer, something all too common in this era of adventure games. In terms of setting, sure, the Chicago of Deja Vu feels like a city. You navigate from street to street, nodes of local architecture to node of local architecture, giving the impression of a larger space without letting you drift into it. If there's anything unfortunate, it's how empty it all feels. Most streets and buildings are empty, and even though the police are supposedly searching for you, unless you're unlucky enough to get caught. The NPCs you do encounter are simple puzzles more than often than not solved with a punch to the face. The only dynamic element to the characters is the random check whether or not they show up, something that can be aggravated with repeatedly encountered enemies like the mugger 
but potentially game derailing for those who with a clue to give you, like the homeless guy. And we didn't even run into the hooker. Despite those criticisms, Deja Vu remains surprisingly playable compared to a lot of other mid-80s adventure games, aided in part by the graphical interface, and in some ways is more coherent than the series' follow-ups, Uninvited and Shadowgate. The plot is delivered in an immersive way, and the humor, while occasionally crude and in poor taste, suits the setting. Like a lot of people, I was more familiar with the console port and wasn't sure just what to expect playing the PC version. Overall, I'd say it was a positive experience and much easier to control with mouse and keyboard than gamepad, even if there were fewer safety rails. As always, if you enjoy these videos, like them, subscribe to the channel, sign up for notifications.